the Shades here from RVT Entertainment. We're here at Ranger Stop 3 2015. And with, who's we here with me? Well, he's the Quantum Ranger, bitch. Dan Southworth. Dan, how are we doing? That's sir? right. All right. <clears throat> now, before we get to the Quantum Ranger, we got, I got to bring up something that I've, I've read about. Is that apparently before you got the chance to play Eric Myers, you actually got to fill in the roles of the Mighty Morphin Black Ranger for the Power Rangers Live Tour. Is that correct? Yes, right. That's yeah. correct. Uh, tell, tell, what, what was that like? Do you remember? Well, Johnny Bosch and I screen tested the same character when uh, Saban was originally replacing the three characters on the show. So they flew Johnny, myself, Steve Cardenas, um, the lead Karen Ashley, and um, I'm blanking on who else was there, so I apologize for that. But uh, they flew us down, put us up in a hotel, we screen tested, and um, they chose Johnny Bosch. <laughs> yeah. Actually, no, it was a good thing because it gave me the opportunity uh, to play the Quantum Ranger 10 years later, which was the best role that was ever made for Power Rangers. So it's, uh, it was a blessing. Anyway, um, so I decided to move to Los Angeles about a month or two later, saved up some money, moved to Los Angeles, figured if I was being screen tested for television roles, leading roles, I should give this acting thing a shot. Uh, it was just something I was trying on a whim. So I did, and I booked uh, immediately, because of my physical ability, um, the live show version, which got a chance to tour the world, and um, I was the Black Ranger. So it would be his face, and his acting and everything, and his voice that I would be performing to. Um, which was kind of a little bit of a stab in the side. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm But sure. Uh, I think I actually got the better deal because I got to travel the world. Um, that, was, that was quite awesome. So but since then, Johnny and I have worked together. We, we get along really well. There's no animosity between us for him being chosen over me <laughs> or anything like that. Hey, you know what? Just leave it at this. You got to be the badass. That's what I'm saying. So, that's, so yeah, definitely. Big. Time Force is one of all of our guys' favorite series, myself included, and definitely Eric is the is the man. Well, so <laughs> you speak the truth, brother. Indeed. Now, speaking of Time Force, one thing I always like to ask you guys is that, and, and I, we've asked this to Jason and Aaron as well, is like, are there any behind the scenes stories that you you yourself could share with us? And we've heard some of them, but I bet there's always more. Behind the scenes stories. Yeah. Um, I think that the few that are worth telling are best reserved for the 18 and over panel. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and really, I don't have a lot of old behind the scenes stories to, to report. Uh, I showed up. I was a square. I showed up. I worked. I went back to my trailer. Uh, sort of ruminated on or um, lamented on why I didn't have more scenes in, in my own. That's about as, as cool as it gets for behind the scenes. I'm mm. so <laughs> the greatest ranger ever. Why am I not on screen more? <laughs> um, and then that was about it. Uh, we were not a cast uh, prone to disputes or dislike of one another. We all got along really well. Um, aside from the fact that I think the rest of them are knuckleheads and at times naive, uh, <laughs> that just plays into the separation of our characters. Mm. Uh, as they played out on screen. So, <laughs> nothing really to report. Oh, and can't blame the guy for trying. Is that my phone or yours? No, it wasn't mine. What knucklehead didn't turn off their phone? <laughs> I'm pretty sure right That's my phone. Some idiot, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Some idiot is texting me while I'm in an interview. Don't they know what the hell is going on? Uh, never without a bodge. RBT Entertainment, never without a bodge. Don't worry, I'll be heading this out later. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the good news is, while that was an interruption, it was an interruption with some good, good information. Ooh. Apparently, there is a place where I've been told where I can find pig's nose whiskey, which is the smoothest whiskey I've had for the price point that it sold at, which is around twenty dollars. Oh, just that's FYI, that's it's very similar to a blue label <clears throat> in taste and smoothness. <laughs> uh, things you learn, folks. <laughs> All right. more, more after this announcement. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of like an advertisement, wasn't it? It did <laughs> sound like that, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now, you've done more than just Power Rangers, obviously. I mean, you you were Virgil in the Devil May Cry series, and you also did some work as Kenshi in Mortal Kombat Legacy. Very awesome. V-Word. V-Word as Kenshi, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I think to date, that's the first live-action appearance of Kenshi, isn't it? As far as I know, yeah. 
I believe. Is the definitive word on chemistry. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but now with with Devil May Cry, of course, you not only had to do voiceover work, but you also had to do the motion capture. How how different is that from doing regular acting? Like, how does that stand out? Well, you show up to a set, and the set is your environment, and you can take cues from the set that they've built around you about your character. Uh, there's information there that, that, that can sort of, you can sort of latch onto and relate with them to when you're working moment to moment in a scene as an actor. And it's nice. It's nice to have props. It's nice to be in costume. All of that stuff is a is a good physical outside in for a character. So it's uh, and it's cool because it's a co usually a collaboration of the costume designer and the set designer and. These are very creative people, and uh, oftentimes something will arrive on set and go, wow, that's really cool, and your job as the actor is to engage your imagination on where that comes from, how that would be used, if at all, in the scene, um, or how it will inform you, at the very least. Uh, when you get into a motion capture situation, it's a, it's a grid that's drawn on the ground, and you're surrounded by upwards of 200 infrared cameras, so there's these red, angry eyes all around you. And towards the end of the day, it can get quite uh, disorienting. But there, that's it. The rest of the world has to be filled in by your own imagination. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I, I think um, it's more like stage acting in that sense, on a blank stage, um, in a black box. So you, you have to, you have to I think it's more engaging, um, uh, definitely of your imagination, and um, you work longer and you work faster. You go from scene to scene to scene. There's no relighting. There's no camera setup. There's no readjusting of the furniture or the in camera angle. It's just boom, scene to scene to scene. So there's right. a lot. There's a higher volume of di uh, material to process and bring to life and understand. So you work. It's a lot harder to work. Mm. Uh, in terms of the volume that gets processed in a day. You'll do probably seven to eight, maybe 10 scenes in a day. Um, some of these motion capture jobs nowadays, we're shooting more like four or five scenes in a day, and they're starting to, to run more like, like film sets in that sense, because the director will really spend time with dramatic pieces. Uh, but still, five scenes in a day is a lot. You know, On a normal film, you're shooting two, maybe three scenes a day really big budget films, you're probably shooting half a scene to a scene a day. And on low budget films where you're trying to shoot the whole film in 18 days, you're in maybe five scenes a day and they're very quick. Mm -hmm. so, so that gives you just an example, an idea of what the pace is like through these different uh, media. Definitely explains why a lot of these, uh, a lot of voice actors out there are actually going on strike over all this. Yes. I'm sure you've heard about that. Well, yeah. voice actors are going on strike because video games producers think that they don't need to hire union talent to make the, the stuff good, yeah. which, is, which is incorrect. Mm -hmm. The union talent is experienced, or very good at what we do, proven, professional. Um, there's, a, there's another part of that that people are, aren't getting, and it's not getting enough publicity, and that's that the motion capture artists are also involved in this strike, mm. because motion capture performers, and I also am a motion capture performer, uh, we are claiming, uh, quite correctly, that you have to be a very well-trained actor to make this motion tell a story. Because mm. most of the video gaming and motion capture that you look at is a visual image. It's not necessarily the voice, it's a visual image that has to be told by a well-trained actor who understands movement and how to communicate. And very often, we are then, along with the motion capture, our voice is recorded. So, in a very unfair way, our voice gets lumped in to the capture of the data that gets transferred into the experience that you have. Um, but it's a complex problem because the, the animators also spend hours and hours and hours, 40, 50, sometimes 70 hours a week, manipulating our performances. But there wouldn't be a structure for them to manipulate if we didn't provide them the creativity to begin with. So it's a very complex issue and game producers are trying to, of course, save money on production. It's understandable. I've produced. I understand what that's like. And therefore, you need to come to the table and negotiate so that everyone can be happy. As far as I'm concerned, the sticking point is uh, concerns residual pay. And 
what they've worked out is a tier program where the more units are sold, the more bonuses you get for being a part of that project where a lot of units are sold. And that coincides with the popularity of the project. I think it's great all around for everybody because every, it, it uh, gives everybody incentive to make the project as good as they can, right. not just get what they can from it, which I think sometimes people can do. However, I would just be happy with motion capture across the board being included in the union so that the performers can get their medical pay, their medical and pension and health benefits. To me, that's more important right now, a fight, than the, the actual residual pay fight. So the residual pay fight is something that the voice actors are fighting for, but I just want motion capture performers to be recognized as union talent because they deserve it. They're very good at what they do. And very often, they are one of the same people. Yeah. And persons. It, a lot of, some of the best games have had involved that kind of stuff. I've, that we were definitely supporters of what you guys are trying to fight for right now. All so they think that they can get some of their staff and employees to fill in for some of these roles. And, you know, I say good luck, good luck to you. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> um, I, another issue is that a lot of times they'll have people perform action without a stunt coordinator on hand. And that can be dangerous. It's just a tad. <laughs> that can be very dangerous. And also, you'll find that you, in comparison to having somebody with experience, you'll have to capture 23, 24, 25 takes. And that's when the body can start to experience oh. breakdown. Yeah. Where injuries can happen. Versus a professional performer who can do it for you in probably about four or five takes extremely well. And then from there, give you all kinds of variations. So I, I really think that they're, they're mistaken in their notion of how much value we add to their product. Mm -hmm. And I think the fans will be able to tell. But in the end, let's be honest, sometimes you just want to play a shooter game and all you need to do is see the hand up in front and point where you want to point, right? So it, it all has yet to, to play out. And only time will tell. Now, you mentioned earlier, you know, being a producer yourself, you've actually done some work. You've got the Dead Egg Divergence, the series that you've worked on. How's that been working out for you, by the way? What do you mean? Well, has, you know, how's the work been going on that? Has it, has the reaction been by fans? What's that going on? Well, I mean, um, we, we've got a tremendous amount of production experience from my, my company, my business partner and I. Um, it was a, a great experience to uh, be involved in. Um, it is reviewed extremely well. It's on a platform called realhouse.com. So you can go there and download the whole season for, I think, $9. And you get 11 episodes. It's 120 minutes of viewing pleasure. Um, and uh, right there at the moment, there's a cliffhanger at the end of the, the, uh, the series. Uh, because at that point in time, like every struggling independent uh, film company, had to wait till we could get more funds to fill it, to finish it, but it's a very good good ride. It's 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 a fun it's a fun show to watch, and we get a lot of compliments on it. And we'd love to come back and finish it someday if we can. Uh, but as is, it stands alone as a as a project it is similar to the experience I used to remember having when I was watching Doctor Who uh, as a kid. So perhaps you may feel the same way after you see it or think that I'm just a rambling idiot just trying to sell my product. <laughs> in which case, you might be right also. Hey, we gave you the platform. That's the whole idea. But hey, you guys check it out. We'll have a link to, to Real House on, uh, in the description so you guys can check that out yourselves. Now, last question I always like to ask is, what can we expect from Dan Southworth as we head towards the future? Well, the future is quite uh, ominous. No. <laughs> you never know. You never know. This entertainment business, where you're going to find yourself and what you're going to be doing. Um, I'm currently preparing for what I hope will be a really kick ass uh, television series, an interview for a really kick ass television series. Whether or not I can even get in a room will be another question. Um, and aside from that, continuing to try to push my own projects and work on new and interesting and exciting projects that other people have. So, you know. Say it's, it's, it's open. You just have to keep looking, and I have to keep. As long as I keep trucking along and trying, there might be something for you to look forward to seeing. But the moment I get tired and go, you know, I've had enough, then uh, I suppose there won't be anything left to look for. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen for a while. Not for a long time. <laughs> I can still do this, so. 
So we got another 10 years at it. I think we're good. But Dan, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. You've been awesome. And you guys stay tuned for more awesome interviews here at Ranger Stop 2015. I'm The Shades, and we'll see you guys next time. Rock on! You know, I'd sit like this because it's manly, but <laughs> I got a little arthritis in my knee, so I'm going to roll with the badassery that uh, has now caught up with me over the years. We're recording, right? Yes. <laughs> we'll edit that. We'll 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 I'm good with editing. We won't keep with. that in. I don't yeah. care. I just we'll put it as a stinger. Yeah, I'm just going to have to get the effeminate posture. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> as you shouldn't have to. All right. There we go.